Surely my God is strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, Your love defends me. Your love defends me. Welcome to Big Tree Wesleyan Church. Most of you are watching online. Uh, hopefully you are anyway. Uh, this is a whole new way of doing church for many of us. And it has been kind of uh, hard to not be together uh, on Wednesday nights and, and here this Sunday morning. Uh, but my son, who is four years old, I am surprised by how much he is uh, feeling the weight of not being able to come to church. He's been very upset to not be able to see many of your smiling faces. And so uh, he asked if I would, because I explained the situation about why we can't really be meeting uh, together and why we have to meet online. And he said, well, I can let you borrow Carter, who is his stuffed animal, who keeps him safe at night and lets him stay in his bed. And he said that he is willing to let Carter protect the entire church. Uh, so just so that you know, you are loved and missed and church is important for all of us. And Jan, if you're keeping attendance today, Carter counts. We want to welcome everyone. This is certainly our first rodeo. We've never been down this road before. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. 
Uh, we ask uh, for your patience and your grace as we endeavor to uh, navigate these unchartered waters. As leadership of Big Tree Wesleyan Church, uh, we hope to be the eye in the hurricane uh, as opposed to uh, contributing to the, to the storm. We want to be that calm, peaceful presence in the midst of chaos. Uh, we want to uh, give a public thank you to J.J. and his assistants, Christina and Martin, uh, uh, for their uh, hand clap. That's cool. All five of you here this morning. We're, we're obeying the rules of the land. I uh, want to thank them for using their millennial gifts uh, to ensure that Big Tree Wesleyan Church is ahead of the curve when it comes to all this uh, tech stuff. If it was up to me, we would still be using overhead projectors and chalkboards. So uh, without further ado, we're going to um, have a call to worship. Psalm 9, 1 through 3. Notice the intentionality of this scripture. I will, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. I believe it's time for Corona to turn back and take a back seat. Better yet, get out of the car altogether. In Jesus' name, this is not your favorite news channel bringing you the latest bad news. This is the Church of Jesus Christ bringing you the latest good news. And so we're here to worship God. Let's praise his name together, the ruler over all things, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name in the
from Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory.
The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it.
encourage everyone even in the sanctuary of your own home avail yourself the altar is open this is a sacred time an opportunity to heed the words of Jesus come unto him
pray together. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Our Father, we humbly bow before you this day, and we acknowledge your greatness. For you are greater than any virus, you are greater than any pandemic. You are the one who still sits on the throne, and we come before your throne with boldness through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, with our confusion with our questions of why, with our uncertainty of the future, with our worry, with our concern. And we lay them all at your feet, casting all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And so, Lord, we thank you for your leading. We thank you that you are indeed the rock that is higher than each and every one of us. We thank you for this sacred time. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together to worship you, to focus on you. Set our hearts free. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. At this time, typically, we'll receive the offering. We won't do that at this time, but I will say this. In light of all the bad news, I want to share some good, good news, some praise reports. I know this is a very difficult time for many of you, an uncertain time, but I want to encourage you to look to the certainty of God. Some of you may not know that today is World Water Day, and my friend Steve is going to bring the Word of God this morning. I know some of you think, well, I am for Pastor Doug, and I am for Pastor JJ, and I am for Pastor Steve. We're all for Jesus here this morning, and it really doesn't matter the name of the vessel bringing the word of God this morning. What matters is that the word of God is being brought. And so we have a wonderful report of the generosity of God's people. More than halfway in get, reaching our goal for the wells in India. And we're reminded this morning that this is a global thing, this corona thing. This is a global thing. It's not just me and mine. It doesn't just affect me and mine. It affects them and theirs. It affects everyone. Philippians 2, 4 says this, and I'll, I'll let Steve do the preaching. It's a danger of giving a preacher a microphone, but <laughs> Philippians 2, 4 is this. Let each of you not only look after his or her own interests, but also the interests of others. It doesn't mean you blow off your interests. You definitely take care of you and yours, me and mine. But man, remember others. In other words, a modern translation, pick up enough toilet paper for you and leave some for others, all right? It's not all about you. Mm -hmm. This is a global thing. And may God use this to help us to think globally because he is a global <clears throat> God for he loves the world. Steve, you come and bring the word of God with clarity and boldness here this morning. God bless you as you, as you come and share. Well, thank you, and good morning to all seven of you, and to those watching by Facebook as well. Good morning. We are living in very, very strange and difficult times. I never thought I would live long enough to hear pastors say, stay away from the church. Do not come to church this Sunday. That's something I never thought I'd hear. That's how bizarre this really is. And though I jest, I am well aware of the heartache and the trauma that this coronavirus is causing for many people. Maybe not for you personally, but I'll bet you know someone who is. None of us are unaffected, myself included. 
I'm not excluded from this. Neither are you. So I uh, want to share that, that this is a very challenging thing to do. But at the same time, I wanted to see and encourage all of you to know that what God has done in this church has been truly remarkable. As you know, uh, this church has celebrated Missions Month and has given money to buy a well in India for a church and village in India for people that do not even have access to clean water while we are washing our hands. Some people can't even find water. So this church has done something significant, something marvelous, something wonderful, and I wanted to thank you for that. So thank you for joining my Facebook Live. I've never done this before either, but it's good to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 10. The sermon today speaks uh, to that issue of how we have donated a particular well for a church in India. Today is March 22nd, World Water Day, believe it or not. And World Water Day was started in 1993 by the United Nations. They did so because they realized that billions of people on the earth don't even have access to clean water like we do. And in terms of clean, abundant water, by the way, we in western New York are the richest people in the world. You may not think so, but because of the Great Lakes that run right through our backyard and into Lake Ontario and so forth. So we are grateful to God, uh, and perhaps you never realized how incredibly blessed we are with the kind of resources that we have here. It might not feel like that today, but that's the world we live in. And this church has done something tremendous and marvelous. And I want to thank God for what you have done. Your donations, your contributions will give a church deep bedrock well, clean water they can use to serve their community for many, many, many years. So I wanted to share that as an introduction to a sermon that explains the importance of what this church has done. So... We did this to serve our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and that is of great value. Let me just show a few slides, if you can see this behind us. I'll move out of the way so you can see this a little clearer. This is a little girl by a well that we have put in a few months ago. And she's drinking clean water that we have drilled about 500 feet into bedrock. This little girl has water for the first time that's clean, that she doesn't have to boil because they have to find water on the surface of the ground and boil it. They do not have to do this for well water. Next slide. Here's another well. You can see there at the tap, these two boys are waving and they're so grateful for clean water. Again, they never would have had this unless somebody donated it. And now they have their own well to serve their church and their community. Everybody gets water for free. It's always free to all. Next slide. Again, here's some children by the taps. And you can, if you can't see the sign, the little plaque says the caring friends of a particular church. Here you can't see the church, a little church in Idaho. The church that funded this is 12 people. Twelve people contributed to buy this well to give this church hope and a future they never even dreamed of. Next. Again, these two girls by, with the church are celebrating water. And the reason why they're happy is they get to go to school. You see, water allows the girls to continue their education. Once they hit 8th, ninth, 10th grade, they quit school usually and have to spend the rest of their lives seven days a week almost most of the day, and they have to get water, and it takes away their life. This gives them an opportunity to continue with their education, then get employed, and actually have a fruitful life that they never imagined. Please know they don't even dream this big. This is the answer to their prayers. Next. And lastly, on this, you can see a little bit, I hope, these are people that have a well, and they have... The, the, the buckets on their head, they carry these jugs of water, and they only have to walk a few hundred yards instead of miles. Let me say that many of these women have to walk up to 12 or 15 miles per day, that's six days, uh, seven days a week, for six hours a day. So please know this is an enormous thing, 
And I wanted to say that to encourage you and to say thank you, thank you for donating a well that will do this kind of good. Next slide. So freshwater friends, we're not just giving water, we're giving everything that water brings. Thank you very much. We're giving everything, meaning you give health and hygiene and care and training and schooling and jobs. Water gives us everything, folks. And we just don't realize it because we've had it all of our lives. But thank you again. And it is a wonderful praise to God that we can do this. And therefore, I wanted to speak from Scripture where Jesus has something to say about what this church has done and in a bigger sense, how that might encourage all of us. So please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. I titled this sermon, What's in a Cup? In other words... Something as simple as this, right? No big deal. It's just a cup. What's in a cup? Matthew 10, verse 42. If you'll turn with me there, please. And if I could have a Bible, that would be nice. Could I grab this one here? I'm like, right there? Right there. No, right there. Thanks. So if you'll join me in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus is speaking here to His disciples and He simply says this, And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because He is My disciple, I tell you the truth, He will certainly not lose His reward. What a simple verse that is. But it's so simple, if you read it too quickly, you misunderstand a little bit here that's going on. Jesus says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, and for years I read that without thinking about it, because we have cold water all the time. We have it in our churches, we have it in our homes. You can't go anywhere in America without getting cold water. Easy. But in Israel, in Jesus' day, they don't have any cold water. There's no refrigeration. There's no refrigerators. Where do you get cold water in Israel? In a well. It has to be in a well. I was in Israel many, many years ago, in the year 2000, on an archaeological dig. And I can assure you, there is no cold water anywhere because all the water on the surface is the temperature of the air, so to speak. And it's interesting that you can get cold water in an open well. We saw that a few weeks ago when Pastor Doug was preaching on the book of John chapter 4, where Jesus met a woman, a Samaritan woman, at the well. Now let me be clear. In Jesus' day, they did have wells, and they were dug wells, they were open wells, hand dug, not with drilling rigs like we use in India and Africa. They had it much tougher. They would dig a huge well all the way down maybe 25, 30, 40, 50 feet, and sometimes deeper. Okay, It's hard to go much further than 80 feet, in fact, if you're doing a manual well. And by the way, it was usually the women who actually dug these wells. In fact, they still do those wells in places in Africa and India. Hand-dug wells. So what Jesus is saying here is, if you're going to give someone a, a, a cup of water to quench their thirst, it's a cup of cold water. Which is interesting. As I said, I was in Israel in the year uh, 2000, and I visited a place called Ahab's Cave. Ahab was a king in the Old Testament. And he had to feed his army water. Well, there's no easy access to water in Israel. So they dug a huge hole in the ground, this cave that we walked into. And there were modern you know, steps made of steel. And as we walked down into the darkness, into this cave, at the very bottom, about 60 feet below the surface, there was water still there. Now, Ahab built this in 860 years before Christ, and it's still there. And as you go down, you can see the water. When I left the surface, it was 116 degrees in Israel in June of 2000. When I went down, however, it was only 64 degrees by the water. Imagine that. So a group of us were standing there commenting that, how long do we get to spend down here? Because I did not want to go back up because it was so incredibly hot. And by the way, there was 116 in the shade. So we were down there enjoying the cool 
water and the cool air. And we looked up and we had to leave. So, of course, I was very polite and I asked everyone, you go first, you go first, you go. Because nobody wanted to leave. We walked up and we realized that I could not find any cold water in Israel except there in the bottom of a well that was 2,860 years old. Interesting. But Jesus says, if you give a cup, just one cup of cold water to one of these little ones, these disciples, you will not lose your reward. That is encouraging because as you look at the text again, Jesus says, and the focus here is what I want to share with you to hear the word of the Lord. If anyone gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple. Now that phrase little one could refer to children, of course, but not exclusively. It could actually refer to all the disciples, not just children, but all disciples, whether you're an adult or a child. In other words, in the mind of Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, they're all little ones in terms of how the world views us. The world views the church very insignificantly. We're Christians. No big deal. And for Jesus to indicate that for anybody, whether a child or an adult, that we don't have any real social power in the world, it's okay that a cup of water given to one of your brothers and sisters in Christ is a big deal to Jesus. It's a really big deal, in fact. It matters because they belong to Christ. It's not that water is such a big deal. It's just a cup, folks. But the fact that you're giving to a brother or sister in the Lord, the fact that you're serving someone in the church, that's a big deal. It's because they belong to Jesus Christ. So doing the smallest thing for your brothers and sisters is a big deal. And and a reward is given, Jesus said, as a result. So one person has a cup and gives one cup of water to one very insignificant, as it were, Christian. And we're all insignificant in that sense, in the world sense. So if I were to give this cup of water to someone, Jesus says, you don't lose your reward. This church has purchased a well. And when it is finished, you will see it. And I want you to remember this and be encouraged, church. You're not giving a cup. You're giving millions of cups. Millions and millions of cups from one well. One of our wells right now routinely gives out a million cups of water every two months. I know, I did the math. Okay, A million cups is 62,000 500 gallons. And they go through that every two or three months. Imagine that. If you give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, one of these disciples, you will not lose your reward. Is that not incredibly encouraging to know that we can do the little things that matter and it's because of the one we serve? You know, there's a commercial with uh, Samuel Jackson we're all familiar with, the Capital One commercial. Or Jennifer Garner, the Capital One. And they always end the commercial with a question. What's in your wallet? You all know that one. What's in your wallet? Well, using this comment from Jesus, I'd like to ask you this question. What's in your cup? What's, what's in your cup? Jesus gives us this statement as an illustration of serving Him in the bigger picture. Of course, if giving a cup of water matters, then everything matters. So the question is, folks, what's in your cup? What's in your cup of service? What's in your cup of opportunity? We have opportunities according to Jesus. And as we serve the Lord, especially as we minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ, that really matters. And that means the things matter that we don't often think matter. The little things about serving the Lord. For example, handing out bulletins in a church. Just a little thing. But how many people might want to do that? But if you're handing out a bulletin to one of your brothers and sisters, suddenly you say, he shall not lose his reward. Are you with me? If you help someone set up equipment here, you're serving your brothers and sisters. 
And Jesus says, you will not lose your reward. In other words, making coffee, putting out water, cleaning the sanctuary. Do you know there's a thousand things we can think of that the little things you're doing that you think don't even matter? Because it's not the content of what we do. It's the one we're serving. It's not what we're doing. It's who we're serving. And that's why Jesus makes it clear that it doesn't matter if it's just a cup of water. No big deal. But it's a big deal when the one you're serving belongs to Jesus Christ. Because in so doing, you're serving Christ. That's the focus we have to have. That's what we lose. Because in our own lives, we look at situations and we think, well, that's a really good way to serve the Lord. But anybody can do that. No big deal. Shoveling snow, no big deal. Well, it is a big deal when you're serving what? Your brothers and sisters. In other words, Jesus invests with importance every little thing you do. And says, by the way, you shall certainly not lose your reward. If you read that Scripture very carefully, in Greek, it's so strong, it's like underlining it, circling, starring it, and bolding it. You shall certainly not lose your reward. Why does Jesus say it that strongly? Because we need motivation. Typically, Jesus does this. He motivates His people with the idea that it matters what you do. And it can change your ideas, your perspectives. Instead of seeing something that's just so trivial, it's no big deal, it's just a donut. Huh? But if you give the donut to a believer, huh? or you give it to a brother or sister, Jesus says that's important. Now let me comment on this too. The Scripture makes it clear, in a bigger sense, that serving anyone in the world matters, does it not? Because all men are made in God's image. It's clear that serving everybody matters to the Lord. But those are other passages, like Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, all men, but especially those of the household of faith. What I'm trying to drive home here is in this passage, Jesus wants you to know that when you minister to your brother or sister in Christ, you're ministering to Him in a very special way. It's so important, in fact, it comes up in Matthew again, chapter 25. If you'll turn there for just a moment, Matthew chapter 25, verse 37. This is such a big deal to Jesus that He actually says in the end of the world, when God separates the sheep from the goats, you know, believers from those who have no faith in Christ, and he evaluates their lives. This is what he says in verse 37. Jesus says this. This is separating the sheep from the goats. Then the righteous, the sheep, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? When, when did we see you this way, Lord? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whoever or whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Do you see the connection? So in other words, God evaluates people on this basis. Did you serve Christ? Did you serve your brother and sister knowing that you're really serving Jesus Christ? That's as close to Christ as you're going to get as your brother and sister. And right now with the struggles and the heartache of this coronavirus, yes, we have brothers and sisters and many others who suffer. And do you know the opportunities we have even in a heartache, even in our own anxiety and our own fears, we cry out to God, we have opportunity to minister to people who are actually in worse shape. And that matters. That means you could write a note in your quarantine, right? You know, writing, by the way, for the younger crowd is when you take a pen, you put it to paper. Okay, not necessarily a text. Okay? The older crowd knows what I'm saying. Remember we used to write letters? It's fun. Take a sheet of paper, maybe. This is like giving a cup of cold water. You take a sheet of paper. Perhaps you can write to someone, a friend, a family member, someone in the church. Or take a card and actually mail a card and write something nice. 
instead of just an email, although you could do that too. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of ways that we can honor the Lord as brothers and sisters by simply doing these things. And they all matter. Every single one of them. And that encourages us. It motivates us because we can become so self-centered. Well, we have a cup. By extension, of course, of Matthew 10.42, which is an illustration, as I said. It's clear that it's an illustration. Lots of ways of serving the Lord. We have a cup of service, but there's another cup. It's the cup that Jesus took. You see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus was tried, before He faced the cross, the Scripture says that He was in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in anguish. He was suffering. And in His own suffering, He says this in Matthew 26, Going a little further, he fell with his face in the ground and said, My father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is referring here to the cup of suffering. It is the cup of suffering when he's on the cross and he will absorb the wrath of Almighty God. He will absorb the righteous wrath of God against sin. Not His sin, but our sin. No wonder Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? That's the cup of suffering. And only Jesus drinks that cup. You and I don't drink that cup. That's His. Jesus drank that cup of suffering. The cup of judgment to take our sins upon Himself. And therefore, to be risen from the dead and then as a living Savior to proclaim forgiveness to all who trust in His sacrifice on their behalf. Let me encourage you that Jesus took that cup, His cup, on your behalf. And the result is Psalm 116. I want to end here with Psalm 116, which says this. This is Psalm 116, verse 13. It reads this way. How can I repay the Lord for all His goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So we have three cups. We have the cup of suffering for Christ. And because of His cup, we drink of the cup of salvation. And because we drink the cup of salvation, Jesus can use that metaphor that we have a cup of service. And God calls us to trust in His Son, to have faith in Jesus Christ and realize that the worst that can possibly happen to you is not coronavirus. No, it's not. The worst thing that could happen to you is what already happened to Christ. He already suffered. He died once for all. It's a done deal. He's on your side. He took it all. All the heartache, all the guilt, all the sins, all the stuff that really causes all these problems on this planet. That's what Christ took. That's what He drank. And He's rewarded. And His reward is you. We are His reward. We are His people. We belong to Christ. And you always will belong to Christ. You belong to Christ because His sacrifice matters. And we give Him thanks. And we give Him praise. And because of that, it frees us to serve like Christ. In His name. To His people and beyond His people. To those who desperately need it. And this little well that this church has funded will do exactly that. It will love God by loving your neighbor, by loving the church, by loving other people, and by extending the love of Christ through water and the Gospel of Christ. That is worthy of praise according to the Scripture. Thank you for your love and your care. Thank you for giving. In all the ways this church serves the Lord. 
thank you. We praise the Lord and give Him thanks for working in our lives, giving us the ability to do this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, during a very difficult and challenging time, we want to give You thanks and praise by Your Spirit to enable us to extend the grace of God beyond our walls. And we pray that You would bring such blessing to Your people that You would kill this virus and end this scourge so that we may continue to serve and praise You during this crisis and after this crisis. Minister deeply to us, Lord, because we look to You. You are the King. You are the Lord. You own it all. And we belong to You. And there, encourage our hearts that during this time, we will serve You by serving Your people and those in our families, those in our communities. Give us that grace, O Lord. And we promise to give You thanks. We promise to give You praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate you bringing the word of the Lord this morning. I just have a few closing remarks and then a benediction. Every little thing you do for others during this difficult time is truly like a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. What's in your cup? More than you realize. This building is closed, but you, the church, are still open 24-7. You can still be the church even from your home. Like Steve said, you could write a letter for you old school people, make a phone call, send the text, an email, whatever it is. You may think it's a small thing, like a small cup of water, but it can make a big difference in someone's life today. So look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others during this difficult time. Give that cup of cold water. Please stand for the benediction. Thank you. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Keep hope alive. The way things are will not always be. God bless you. Thanks for coming out to church. Tune in next week. JJ and I will be uh, tag team preaching. It'll be fun. <laughs>